Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We have a record number of people joining us live. I'm excited to see people here from the UK through to Canada, South Africa, Zimbabwe. Welcome, everybody. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce my co-host, Jane Moores, as well as our guest for, the, for today, Dr. Omega Bardenhorst clinical psychologist, she's here today to give us some practical advice on how to be okay during this continued time of stress and anxiety. I'm going to be busy in the socials. I'm going to be sharing links, um, there's polls you can uh, fill in and questions you can ask. So Jane, without further ado, over to you. Thank you, Jen. We really are excited about today and today's webinars. And Jennifer and I have really been enjoying doing these webinars. We've been doing them since the beginning of lockdown. And it started off just as an idea to really support our clients and our friends um, with this group that we have touch base to really just, you know, discuss the issues that are impacting all of us in the workplace. So Jen is normally busying herself with researching the backgrounds of CEOs that companies want to hire and want to make sure that everything they say they have, they do have. And I am normally training companies on how to hire the right people. And we also train companies globally on coaching skills. But today we're really excited to welcome you, Omega. Thank you so much for being willing to share your experience and expertise. Um, I know it's meant to be mental health week this week. Uh, but as my husband said, I think every week is mental health week during this time. <laughs> indeed, <laughs> so, indeed. <laughs> but Jen introduced you a little bit. So let me ask you a little bit more about your background, just so we can get a glimpse into what type of experience you're bringing forward to share from today. So maybe you can start off just by telling us how you got interested in psychology and what your experience has centered around primarily. Okay, so I think, you know, my journey as a psychologist started from the age of eight, where I knew wow. that this is what I wanted to do. So then, of course, just had some life experience and eventually landed up getting qualified, studying and all of that. So my first degrees were in fine art, in filmmaking, and of course also exercise science. So I am also a qualified personal fitness trainer. Um, wow. Yeah, so all of that just helps so much with people that I work with therapeutically. So I'm very mm. much an in-depth ther therapist working from a psychodynamic perspective. Um, but yeah, like I, I look at each individual and then see how do we, you know, how do we move forward in terms of guiding the process? Mm, excellent. Now, I love that kind of background and how you can draw on it to be able to help your clients. Yeah. And I'm sure no, that means that you too are very fit and healthy and exercise Ooh. well. Um, I would like to, you know, I think that would be the hope. But as we all know, with lockdown, it's sometimes with motivation, it's a bit difficult. So, but we'll get in, into that in a bit. <laughs> Apparently, in the beginning, there were many very busy physiotherapists, but the people who were trying to mm. jog around in small circles and hurting their knees yeah. and ankles and things. So, <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Because okay. people are desperate to do something. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm so glad we can run and walk a little bit now. So, Omega, again, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much for everybody who's here joining us today. And I can see all your messages in the, in the chat box. It's wonderful to have people from all over the world. And we want to encourage you to post your comments as you join and as we go along. Please post your questions. You'll see you can either post your questions in the chat box or there's a place to ask a question. And every now and then, if there's a number of questions, Jen will pop up from our backstage area and alert us so that Omega can answer a couple of those. There's also a poll that she'll send out so that you can be able to say, hey, you know, this is, this is how I'm feeling today. 
And at the end, we'll have another opportunity for Omega to answer any questions that you may have. We don't want you to just ask questions, though. We really value that you have your ideas, your expertise, things that are working for you over this time. And so we encourage you to share that as well in the chat box so we can all learn from one another. But Omega, let's jump into it. You said you're an in-depth yes. person. Let's jump in deep. <laughs> Tell us. During this time, I mean, you know, yesterday when we had our test run, you were sharing about how during this time, um, it is unprecedented. It isn't something we can refer back and say, oh, oh this is how we dealt with it last time. And uh, you said that even the mental health workers are feeling like they're navigating new ways of, of helping clients mm -hmm. and the, the amount of clients that you have. So yeah. please tell us a little bit more about how this time has been different for you. What are the different cases, different situations mm -hmm. that have come up during COVID-19? Okay, so I think, you know, to start off, um, the message that is important is that it's okay not to be okay during this time. So that we need to remove the pressure that we need to be functional and we need to be proactive and productive and all of those things. So we need to sort of put that a bit aside and also allow ourselves some time to go, it's okay to not be okay at certain times during the, the lockdown period and COVID-19. But I think the key thing is that this is a very difficult time because there's no textbook. There's no textbook mm. for doctors. There's no textbook for mental health workers. And there's no textbook for anyone to go, okay, here's what I need to do X, Y, Z in order to, you know, to figure out how to do this. So I think what has definitely come up is that there's been a rise with people, you know, that normally in like with, especially within my practice as well, where people just, use therapy as a, a guiding process now all of a sudden some people are experiencing becoming like clinically depressed and have severe anxiety and all of those things so there's definitely a rise in mental health decline because of the lockdown and it is and because we don't have textbooks around these things one has to sort of think out of the box as a therapist on how do you guide you know your client in terms of who they are and what they're busy experiencing and how can you just assist them in the process? Because I think the key thing here is all of this is so out of our control. We, we can't go and say X, Y, Z again. It is literally just have to go and surrender to the fact that COVID-19 is out of our control. The rules, the regulations, the legislations out of our control. So we need to just learn how mm. to cope with it better it so that's sort of been the experience mm. that it's definitely not the norm we don't have a frame of reference for it and that's what makes it difficult okay so I, I understand that that makes it difficult also from a mental health practitioner's mm. perspective um, but in your view is that sense of uncertainty and having no precedent something that contributes to the types of themes that are surfacing amongst your clients, your existing and new clients? Absolutely. Um, uncertainty would be the top thing. And even, you know, from a professional's point of view, like sitting here going, my own personal experience with COVID-19 is that thing of the uncertainty that we don't know where we're going, um, mm. that that also has an impact on my own life. And I have to sort of adjust my own therapeutic skills to that as well. So the uncertainty sort of what it does is it that would be the main umbrella theme of COVID-19 versus mental health would be the uncertainty. And then, of course, it trickles down into various different aspects. So what I see a lot is relationships, for example, that it is either where you know, OK, this is the person for me because you guys are actually getting on well but also people that have been living together for a very long time in long-term relationships are actually starting to find it very difficult to be in a space 24 seven, because normally we go to work, we go out with friends or so there's some kind of me time within relationships. 
Whereas with COVID-19 mm. and the lockdown mm. makes it a bit difficult. So I would yeah. say my key, my key thing there is that if you're a couple experiencing difficulty in this time, create me time, have like a conversation that is open and honest and go, it's not about you. It's just, I need some time away. I just need some time to do whatever it is that I want to do and set those boundaries in place. And then that sort of helps couples through this time. The other big one that I've seen is parents experiencing a lot of guilt going, I don't like my children anymore <laughs> because now they are constantly with their kids and there's not that space of kids going to school or to aftercare. So now parents are faced not only with having to still work from home, be parents, do life and do homeschooling. So you find it a lot that the guilt around parents, like what they feel around how they feel about their kids is starting to crop up. And what I would want to say is like, this is normal because we, it, we you're not used to it. It's like from one end of the spectrum to another end of the spectrum of where people are going in each other's space all the time. Mm -hmm. And especially with the little ones as well. So little ones can't cognitively say to you, this is why I am upset or a bit irritated. They react physiologically. So they would be irritable. They would throw their tantrums and all of those things because they don't know how to explain things. So a lot of parents are finding a lot of difficulty around that. So those yeah, relationships, um, parents, um, but the uncertainty thing, just going back to the umbrella term, has also got a lot to do with a sense of purpose, where people find that they're losing motivation, whether it is around work, whether it is around their relationships, or whether it is around how they feel about life. So I'm finding a lot of people going, I just want to sleep. I don't want to, you know, I just want to sleep through this thing. I don't know what, what is my purpose here? What am I, what am I supposed to be doing? Um, and I think for, for all of that, it's just going back again to it's okay to not be okay. Mm. That, that is, yeah. we, we need to stop, put pressure on ourselves to make something awesome out of this experience. It is not, you know, human, if we look at how we are structured as humans, it is difficult to find like the, you know, to make the awesome out of this, this experience. Mm. So it's about mm -hmm. the pockets of joy. Definitely po find pockets of joy that you can, you know, that sort of uh, fuels the, the spiritual side of life, like how you feel about life and existing. Mm. So tell us, tell us a little bit more about the pockets of joy um, that you're advocating and, you know, what, what some of your clients are finding to be pockets of joy that maybe people can get ideas from that. Yeah. So the key thing around pockets of joy, it can be anything from a good cup of coffee. It is so instead of reaching for, you know, the, the, the instant coffee, go for the nice coffee, like the percolated coffee or whatever the case might be. That, that is something It's to be mindful of the moment of what your experience is. Yeah. So it is things around coffee, but the more other things is if you are someone that is sort of, naturally creative one thing that i have found with some of my clients is, is to sort of go back and test out your creativity again not about creating the perfect artwork but just to put whatever is happening in here just put it on there whether it is just taking black paint and splattering it on the canvas that's good enough hmm. so the pockets of Joy is to go back into the small things that you that you find enjoyment in. Hmm. Reading a book, listening to podcasts, creating a playlist of music for every day. So have like a happy playlist, an angry playlist, a confused playlist, a breakup playlist, whatever the case might be. Is like just you know, put things, those are the pockets of joy that, that I'm referring to is the small things that don't take a lot of effort. Hmm, I love that. I think somebody actually shared with me yesterday, she said she tries to make one thing each day where she really enjoys herself. 
um, just mm. something that she, you know, makes her happy. And that just yeah. kind of helps her have a little lift in each day. Mm. Yeah, and that's okay. important to, because we need to, as human beings, we are so focused on the negative stuff. So we, we actually forget about the good things that happen in a day or the positive things that happen in a day. Like, for example, I know I'm going back to coffee, but I did see someone said coffee snob here. Yes, I am a coffee snob, definitely. Okay. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, is that, you know, those things are so important. It's like just to focus on those positive things that happen because we are so bombarded by negative stuff. And we always internalize the negative stuff and the positive stuff just goes over our heads. We don't, yeah. we don't allow it process it and actually internalize the happiness as well so like mm. what your friend does like, that's perfect it's find those pockets of joy make sure you internalize it don't dismiss mm. it as just okay tick, i've done something positive for today no it is about internalizing the experience okay so there's some of that concept of mindfulness in there when it comes mm. to the pockets of joy as well then really absorbing yourself yeah. in the experience yeah, I love that. I, I actually, you, when you mentioned coffee, um, that's one of my skills I've learned during <laughs> during this time is how to actually make proper coffee. And it really is joyful, even though it takes 10 minutes. Mm. It feels really rewarding, that's, you know. So mm. I see Jennifer has popped up. Jen, what do you I want to share with to. us? I'm sorry, I'm having a bit of a giggle because I put up a new poll for us. <laughs> And the poll says coffee equals joy, and we've got six yes votes so far. Seventy-five percent of you say that coffee equals joy. Ooh, it's ten. It's no ten votes. Coffee wins the day. Okay, I'm out again. I'll see you on the other Thank side. You. So, if there's one thing, Omega, that people can take away from this is that they can make some good coffee, and that that will improve their day if they're a coffee lover. Um, Omega, tea also, as in the good tea as well. Sorry, I said a good tea as well is just as good <laughs> as a good coffee for the tea drinkers out there. <laughs> absolutely, no, absolutely. But I am interested in the guilt um, that you spoke about, and I think you've mentioned that that's been a recurring theme with some of your clients during this time. Is that sense of guilt either because you know, they um, they should be more productive and under your under your mm -hmm. ambit of it's okay not to be okay. And I resonate yeah. that with, with that because I easily feel guilty. I set high standards for myself. And if I don't reach all of those, then I feel guilty. And something I was speaking to a friend about um, yesterday as well, she's actually also, she's not a psychologist, but she's a counselor. And she said mm -hmm. she's also working with a lot of people around guilt. And the sense that it comes from that, cognitive distortion of should so we see yeah. the person who's you know typically you know writing the book although i must confess i have mm. actually got a draft book with my dad ready <laughs> but but besides that you know the people who there's always yeah. someone who's doing more or doing something better or you know i look at people and i and i um there was a friend of mine that um I spoke to on the phone and she was like, oh, Jane, I've been on this amazing diet and I've lost nine kilograms. And she was like showing me this like yeah. little Barbie figure that she has. And the first thing I was happy for her, but the first thing I felt was oh, guilt. Oh my goodness, I haven't lost nine mm. kilograms over the time. You know, what is wrong with me? Yeah. Does that mean I'm not disciplined? Yeah. Does that mean that I'm not serious about my health? You know, I mean, so I think yeah. what's, um, what's interesting is that often I think we feel guilty about the parts in our life, uh, our lives, where we don't already feel really good about ourselves or really confident. Mm -hmm. And that kind of should mindset can really set us on a yeah. spiral. So I don't know, tell us more about that and what, what you find helps people with that, with that guilt. So... What you know, like the, the first thing I would say is try and limit social media during this time, not only around news and all of those things, because there's a lot of there's a lot of posts about people how how they're busy coping with COVID nineteen and the lockdown. And you know, like for for example, like there's a lot of 
moms that are doing great things with their kids being at home, like craft work. You know, they they amazing craft ideas that they came up with with their kids. And it is fantastic that some parents have that ability to go and do these things. But for a lot of other parents, again, on the other side, that don't have a sense of creativity or time because they're still working from home or they're actually at, at work, um, then that sense of guilt sort of comes in going like, am I a bad parent? Mm. My kid isn't mm. fun under lockdown. Am I a bad mom? You know, so mm. we need to remove that pressure and also because there's always this thing around with this global experience of um, COVID-19, we very easily put ourselves all under one roof. I think the one meme that's out there that is quite true is we're all in the same storm, but we're in different boats. Mm. So everyone, every person is going to be a bit different. And I think that's a key thing also around certain t type of personalities. Some people mm. in the... In the face of anxiety or something like a pandemic like COVID-19 would gear up you know they've got the armor on and they go and go like okay I'm gonna do this I'm gonna I'm gonna start writing that book that I've been threatening for the last 30 years to write I'm gonna start doing this all of this and but that's part of their personality hmm. and then you have other people who sort of go they just want to sit back just see what's going on but a lot of the time also feel guilty because other people are doing these amazing things out there. Right. Right. So yeah. the key thing for that is, is remove the pressure people, like take it away. Like don't sit there and go, I should be this. I should be doing this day by day. Hmm. Surrender to the fact that we don't have control over COVID-19 and all of the lockdown and all of those things. And just allow yourself to be, whether it is if you're okay or if you're not okay, just allow yourself to be. Mm. Yeah, I love that yeah. allow yourself to be because, as you say, I love, and I also love that meme, I haven't seen it, of all of us being in different boats. Mm. But it's true, we all are different, we're wired differently, we have different coping mechanisms. Mm. So to keep comparing ourselves to other people or other situations can be very yeah. destructive. And if, um, yeah, if you don't have to be on social media, I think a lot of us have to be on social media for our work. But otherwise, mm -hmm. yeah, limit, as you say, limit limit what's coming in. Limit the things that we know yeah. to us or trigger, trigger that negative response. Yeah. I think something mm -hmm. else that was interesting um, that you mentioned that I've, and I've also heard a lot of other people mention is the sense of relationships. Um, I definitely know of people who've said, oh my goodness, I don't want to be in lockdown because I go to work to get away from the person I'm, I'm living with. Mm. So, yeah. now you can't, you know. So, um, yeah. again, speaking to people, I think there's a, um, you know, she said at the beginning of lockdown, she said, okay, what's probably going to happen is that whatever is a deficit in your life, um, that you've maybe been trying to run away from or get away from will be highlighted during this time. It will come to the fore. And so then Absolutely. we need to choose how we're going to deal with that. So I liked what you were saying about, you know, we need to acknowledge what comes up within ourselves because different things are going yeah. to surface in each of, within each one of us. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit more about that, Rebecca, what you've been seeing and what's been helping people with that. I think the thing is, you know, as psychologists, when we see our clients, like the key thing for us is to also guide a process where we help people gain insight and awareness into their difficulties, into their behaviors. And interest and sitting with one's emotions is one of the things we sort of really want our clients to do. But now we're in lockdown and COVID-19 and it's 24-7. I just want to make sure that people understand that, that is not sitting for 24-7 inspection and your own emotions all the time. So that is the key thing what I've realized is now all of a sudden people are exposed to this themselves the entire day. There is no switching off from the psychological processes that are busy occurring within the person. But 
now the key thing around that is just to act, firstly acknowledge the emotion. So for example, really having a bad day, you're feeling sad, you're feeling angry, acknowledge those emotions and try and get to an understanding as to why are you experiencing the emotion. But then it's going, okay, they're here, but now let me, then I can go. So work, work through it and then go, what is the best way to actually sit with this? Am I? And people cry. If you need to cry, please cry. Like go and find a good corner in the house somewhere and cry. It is really needed because we're trying to be strong. Like also South Africans are extremely resilient by nature. So we have this, I need to be strong mentality that is quite, you know, it's quite a part of being South African. And I think sometimes we just need to let that go a little bit and say, okay, we can, you can, you can find your strength in moments where you feel despair. Absolutely. So just acknowledge the emotions for what they are, where they're coming from and sit with it. But then if you can find something to go and do your pocket of joy to sort of steer you a bit of a way to not just be trapped by the emotions, then that is good. Because of course, as I say, like as psychologists, the, you know, like, yes, we want people to have introspection and think about their own processes, but definitely not all the time. I mean, even psychologists a lot of times struggle because we, we analyze things and we go, okay, this is X, Y, Z, so this could be happening. I find myself where I just need to put a screensaver of the ocean on so I can just stare blankly in it, not think. And that's my pocket of joy because I can't actually go and stand on, in the ocean and by the ocean. But anyway. Managing our emotions um, and being honest about what we're feeling. <laughs> Um, and it reminds me, my, um, my husband wrote an article that was in the Stellenbosch newspaper this week around um, something called bad faith that he said was actually mm -hmm. a notion um, by Sartre, which I'm, sh I'm sure you're familiar with. But he talked yeah. about the concept of how important it is that when things come up, that we need to be honest with ourselves. And so sometimes, um, you know, these deficits or these areas, I think, can be highlighted. But if we yeah. just ignore them, they're not going to get any better. So I like what you're saying about acknowledge them, but you don't have to sit and introspect 24-7, even if you have the time yeah. to. That you still balance yes. that with your pockets of joy and, you know, with your other coping mechanism. Mm. Yeah. So tell us more about the other coping mechanisms that you're finding are really helping your clients over this time. Okay, so exercise is the big one. Um, so, you know, I think everyone is very thankful for the exercise timing that we have in the morning, although there are some disputes around it, but the, the actual timing. But I think exercise is definitely one of those things because, you know, when we're in lockdown, the body sort of goes into this hibernation mode because a normal day would consist out of you get ready in the morning, you get in your car or on transport and you go to work. When you're at work, you do your work, but you get up, go make some tea, you go speak to a colleague. So there's actually a lot of physical movement in a normal day. With lockdown now, because we are entrapped by, by walls and, you know, that we're not allowed to really move a lot or it is the body goes into this hibernation mode and stores a lot of energy. So what I found is a lot of my clients also feel quite sluggish. And then the moment mm -hmm. they go and take part of the exercise um, hours in the morning, they actually start to feel better. So the other coping mechanism that I do advise my clients that works really, really well. If you are working at home, work for an hour, then walk around for five to 10, ten minutes. I can do mm -hmm. exercises and do an ab workout. I'm saying just walk around so that your body can get used to the fact of what, what it was. Not that it needs to sit, rest, restore, and fall asleep. Essentially, that's because a lot of people are actually getting really tired during the day and not understanding why. Mm -hmm. But it's because we're not mm -hmm. used to being still all the time. Yes, so exercise yes. is definitely 
good coping mechanism. Um, or even just, let's not call it exercise, uh, because that also a lot of people will go, but I don't like exercise, I don't feel like exercising. So let's say physical movement, just getting up and walking around, going to the mirror, making funny faces at yourself, whatever. Like just that there is some kind of physical movement of getting yourself up and just getting the, the motor starting of the body. Hmm. Okay. And I know you, you yeah. said that, you know, exercise was part of what you'd studied. Um, what are the other beneficial ripple effects of doing exercise just on your mind and your, your soul, perhaps, the other areas that are not just physical? Yeah. Like, look, the, the, there are countless studies. I mean, anyone can just Google the, the positive effects of exercise on mental health. Um, so the thing is, something as little as 30 minutes of coffee times a week has got an effect on the on the chemistry within the body so what happens is like when we just elevate our heart rates a little bit we have the endorphins which is of course the the, the body's happy drug so that in itself assists people with depression anxiety and all of those things and if you get into a proper exercise routine it is that all that you give to the engine which is your body and it helps you cope better with stress. It helps you cope better with, I mean, it builds your immunity, number one, which I think in the time of COVID-19 is very, very important, is that it is, you know, making your immunity stronger. So, but the mental health effects is just, it's amazing. But also you need to get into it guilt-free. And I, I, I'm putting Thank it there, guilt-free, guys. <laughs> Yeah, so it is just once you can get into it. So even something like yoga, um, Pilates, if you're not someone that enjoys cardio, um, just those kind of things. Playing with your kids, guys, that is a big workout. Playing with little ones. It really, really, if you had to look at how much energy you exert, it's a lot. Some extra motivation now to play with the, with the young kids. Mm. Exactly. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's encouraging to hear that it doesn't have to be, you know, two hours a day. That you're saying, even if we just manage a little bit of exercise, it has such a positive effect. Um, so I think that's encouraging for people who don't really like it. I mean, I'm on the extreme where mm -hmm. I felt like I was doing so much exercise before lockdown. So it's a real struggle not yeah. to do that same amount now and then not to feel guilty. Yeah but i'm not doing that mm. amount so yeah, yeah so again it's around removing the pressure mm. yeah to just be in what we are right now yeah no oh, helpful and omega tell us um i know that you know so you've given us some good advice what is some of the bad advice or unhelpful advice that's going around that you think people should not listen to because we see some people post things on social media. I know you, you, I'll let you share it, but you mentioned something very unhelpful yeah. yesterday. What are the mm -hmm. things you think people shouldn't be doing or listening to? I think the first thing you should not listen to is any article or social media that says you should be doing this during lockdown. Mm -hmm. You do you what is good for you, not what someone else is. Because remember, life is, or experiences is, is not a cookie cutter equation. You can't apply everything that works for one person on another person. So I would try and avoid engaging too much with things that says, you know, we are in this lockdown together, but this is what you should be doing with your time. Scrap mm. it, do what you need to do for you. What I have seen has been quite problematic is that there has been some life coaches that have done some articles and sent some posts around going, you need to do X, Y, Z with your time in lockdown and during COVID-19. If you don't do these things, you are wasting time and you are a failure. So these are really, I mean, from, you know, mental health professionals' point of views, like when we see things like that, we 
you know, we sort of get a bit hulky. We, you know, like I know psychologists are cool, calm, calm and collective, but push us to a point, you sort of see these things coming out. And I think I had one of those experiences reading that post going, this is not okay. We can't, it is quite irresponsible to put something like that out there because you're immediately saying to someone that whatever you're feeling, number one, I'm dismissing. Hmm. Number two, you are not good enough because you are not doing these things. You're not doing an online course. You're not doing um, losing the weight that you wanted to lose. You're not doing any of these kind of things. And I think that is quite irresponsible. So I want to caution people to not focus on any of those kind of posts that say this is what you should be doing. Hmm. Hmm. You are yeah, the best. I, I... You are the best. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think um, I was in a webinar the other day and somebody said, you know, people should stop saying that this time is difficult. It's not difficult. Mm. It's just different. And when I heard that, I yeah. thought, no, that's true. It's not difficult. It's just different. But then mm. a day later, when I was feeling anxious and feeling uncertain and I thought, oh, I'm finding this difficult. I thought, no, 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 but what's wrong with me? I should just be thinking that this is different. It's not difficult. Mm. So I'm not saying I feel that way all the time. I think I'm having those normal mm. ups and downs, um, yeah. you know, that everybody is experiencing. Mm. But it's very important, as you say, to not lay judgment on ourselves as soon as we have a certain emotion or response mm. that is not the same as the cookie cutter one that's yeah. being promoted out there. Mm. But Omega, I think, you, you know, another thing you mentioned is that, um, you know, I mean, I think all of us are navigating it in our own way and all of us at some time are feeling maybe positive emotions, hopefully, but also mm -hmm. ones of anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. fear, you know, whatever the case may be, lack of sense yeah. of purpose. So those things will come and go, but how do we know when is that serious enough or to the extent that we should now get professional help? Because you were saying that even some of your clients who who weren't clients before and, and maybe even had really good coping mechanisms in general are now finding that they're moving into clinical anxiety or depression. Yeah. So what are some of the flags for people to know, okay, at this point I should be getting more professional help? Okay, so I think the first thing is, is, you know, you have a lot of people, especially for people who live alone, is have a support network. So have your friends, family members, um, colleagues that you trust, that you can voice some concerns or how you're feeling. If that, anything from where you are starting to feel like, you know, when you wake up in the morning and you go like, I actually can't do this day and I don't want to do this day. That would be mm. reason for you to go, do I need to consider to maybe get to speak to someone professionally? If my support network isn't helping me in that situation, if it's not lifting me out of it, then, then you mm. need to go see, you know, get a, the assistance of a professional. So, because the thing is, we, we trained in the human mind and it's, and luckily psychology has become a lot more, acceptable for a lot of people so it's not you know, 30 years ago where you really had to be ill to see a psychologist that stigma is yes there's still some stigma around psychology but it is it's much better than what it used to be so you can like that's what i say to people it's you don't need to be diagnosed with a disorder or be depressed or have anxiety or you know have bipolar in order to see a psychologist you can just come and see someone to speak because it's about the process. It's about the very private and confidential mm. process that is there to assist you. So I would just take note of if you find yourself sleeping a lot more, um, feelings of dread, if, if you're feeling worthless, helpless, all of those kind of things, then I would say start thinking about maybe speaking to someone. Mm. At, mm. Sort yeah, of so it's having those, of, yeah. having those ongoing emotions or feelings mm. or thoughts and you're saying your normal coping mechanisms or your normal trusted network 
isn't working anymore. That's, yeah. So it's still it's still using our normal support networks that we've built, which mm. might look different for everyone, um, yeah. and our normal coping mechanisms. But then, and don't feel ashamed to go and see seek professional help. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a wonderful privilege to be able to just sit and talk to someone who's really mm. focused on listening to you and helping you. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, th I think also as you've as you've mentioned before, um, it doesn't necessarily mean you need to enroll in weeks and weeks of therapy. I mean, one or two sessions could even help somebody um, move out of that and move forwards. No, absolutely. That's what we would refer to as solution focused therapy. Is if someone mm -hmm. goes, for example, like. You know, I, I want to get into exercise, but I'm struggling with motivation. You can have one or two yes. or three sessions with a psychologist that assists you in, okay, here's the solution focus that we need to focus on. Let's try these things. And then sort of that's where you'll start getting the ball rolling in terms of that process. So there are ways. It's, therapy is not always about years and years of therapy. It can be solution focused. Yes, yes. So on that, I know Ian had a question he posted in the chat box. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that you use a psychodynamic approach. So Ian is saying, please, can you elaborate on that and just explain what that approach involves? Okay, so what that approach involves is basically we I look at a deeper sense of the history. So whatever, especially childhood, so childhood very much like in the psychodynamic um, framework is about that is your blueprint, sort of how we start functioning as adults. So a lot of the time when we're currently experiencing difficulties, we need to go back to see what caused those difficulties to present now. Is it around temperament? Is it around my personality type? What is the case? But you need to go back. So that is the psychodynamic framework is looking at the deeper, in more in-depth senses of history, of how that plays out now. I mm -hmm. hope that does answer, but Ian, there is also, there's amazing websites that explains a lot. So, you know, your psychodynamic framework would be a lot around Freud and Jungian ideolo ideologies and all of those kind of things. Mm. Okay. And I think um, sometimes people also use uh, maybe the, the shorter kind of more solution oriented Omega might be around the more cognitive behavioral approach. Yeah. Can you tell us a little yes. bit more about that and how that helps if you're not going to go into the history okay. this time? Yeah, so the thing is, is like with, you know, I sort of sometimes steer away from talking about frameworks because the thing is like, yes, I do practice from a, a psychodynamic framework, but every client I see is an individual. So I will, I will, it, it will always be an integrative approach. You'll find some people that can't work with um, cognitive behavioral therapy because it's too much homework or it's a bit too structured for them. But so, but if there are parts of um, CBT, for example, like recording your moods or an emotional chart or those kind of things, you can still introduce that even within the psychodynamic framework. But again, you know, it's about looking at the individual and what works for them. But hmm. Cognitive behavioral therapy works really well if you are someone that is structured because it gives you a lot of things that you can actually look at and go, what is my thought? What is it that I want to achieve? Do I need to do a cognitive restructuring and reframe it? But it takes practice also. It is not just, and as I say, it's not for everyone. Hmm. No, sure. You I mean, I think I, I sometimes find that approach helpful for myself if I'm doing a little bit of self-help and just as my own personal yes. coping mechanism. If I'm feeling really mm -hmm. low to think, okay, what have I been thinking that has been influencing my yeah. emotions to now I want to influence my behavior. So so that that sometimes mm -hmm. does help me to move forward. But I also see value yeah, in saying okay, what is being triggered at a deeper level that I've maybe been ignoring yes. and now is a great time to deal mm -hmm. with that. Yeah. No, absolutely. So the thing with CBT is a lot of the times you'll find that there's some unresolved emotions or residual emotions from maybe an experience before that you didn't realize what was there, but now doing the very structured unpacking of things, 
these kind of mm. things come up, but that, that's mm. where the in-depth work would sort of come into play is go like, let's look at what those mm. residual emotions and feelings are about. Mm. Mm. Okay, great. And Omega, um, for people who might want to get more professional help at this time, um, but sometimes, you know, during this time, everybody, um, well, not everybody, <laughs> a lot of people are in a situation where they maybe have lost their work or, you know, had cuts in their income. <laughs> and so they're thinking, I'd like to get help, but, oh, that's expensive. Are there any free avenues or avenues that don't cost a lot that you could recommend people to visit um, if they need that kind of help and they, they're not able to afford, you know, kind of hourly rate of a psychologist? Yeah, so like, you know, like the first thing I would say is definitely contact SADAC. Um, I think it's SADAC.org. So it's a South African depression um, organization. So they've got helplines on there. So you can speak to a counselor online anonymously and all of those kind of things. So that is something that can assist. Um, look, I, I don't want to make this a general statement in regards of my profession and my colleagues, but a lot of a lot of psychologists are doing some work at much lower and reduced fees because they're understanding the the need that is out there within our communities and that is, you know, especially around financial stresses. I mean, a lot of people have lost their main income. So I think, you know, for a lot of psychologists, we are cognizant of that. So it is about looking what psychologists are in your area and just write them a mail. Some people are going to say this is the fee and that is it. Other people will go, okay, I do have a COVID-19 fee that if we discuss that, that it's not long-term therapy, that it's just yeah. around a specific you know, like a, a solution focused type thing that they need to address. Hmm. And I love seeing that human side of everyone at this time, as I think, you know, most people I know have got an avenue where they're providing free support um, to kind of mm. COVID-19 cases and situations, if you like. Yeah. Um, we are all in that, in it together. But I think, as you say, we've got to first be able to acknowledge that it's okay not to be okay. Mm and not just keep pushing ourselves and thinking I should be, you know, why, what's wrong with me, so. But Omega, is there, um, I wanted to just check with Jen on what the questions are, if there are any questions that are, that, yes. are um, that are waiting to be answered, but is there anything else you'd like to share before we see what questions people have? You know, I think the thing is like, the, the main thing, and I mean, I, I find myself repeating this quite a bit in my uh, practice, is surrender to the fact that we don't have control over COVID-19. Number two, it's okay to not be okay. That, that would be the key thing. Just those two lines gives a bit of, you know, makes one feel okay. It's okay. And there's a lot of people going through this. So, the third thing would be you're not alone. Mm. It is it is that really is about we are all in the same storm. We are just in different boats. That's mm. it. Yeah. So I think that would be that the is. main thing that I would say to end off on that. Thank you. I must say that always helps me to know that I'm not alone. I'm a real herd animal. Mm. I don't yeah. like, I'm not alone. <laughs> My boat has got other people in it. <laughs> or some so of we have five minutes left and we have two questions that we haven't answered yet. The first one is okay. from Ian. Thank you for that one, Ian. It says, which supplements are helpful, especially for concentration at work? So, um, yeah, what would your advice be on that, Omega? Um, I would definitely, like, look, I think during this time with um, COVID-19 is to go the full vitamin route, so your viral guards, your calci beta. The main thing for, you know, for mental health that assists in concentration and all of those things in terms of natural supplements is omega-3s. So the tablets are quite big, just a warning, but you do get ones that are tinier, but you're going to have to take more. So if you don't, especially if you don't like the taste of fish oil, so otherwise you can put it in a smoothie, but omega-3 is quite important. 
your namesake. Yeah, no, it's it's a bit embarrassing. That from making a mega tweet. <laughs> you can make some extra money from that. Um, so thank you, thank you so much um, for, for for your advice there. Then we have two more. Thank thank you for everyone. We're going to try our best to answer all our questions. Ian has given us another amazing question. How do I encourage my parents? They're in total isolation at the retirement center. I phone every day. Is there a specific way I can help? I think many of us can say yes. We're worried about our parents. Mm. Okay. So <laughs> I'm gonna give you the honest, honest truth here. Yeah? Parents are stubborn. They are really, really stubborn. I found it with my own parents going like, please just stay at home, like avoid going out. And they're just like, no, nope, no one's going to tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. Like I've been doing it for the past 60, 70 years of my life. But I think in regards to having a, a support, it's really difficult, especially within the retirement villages, because access is quite strict. So you can't just go and visit number one because it's a high risk but it is very difficult to actually have that engagement so what i would say if it is feasible have if you have something where your parents can actually communicate with you online that would be the best way to sort of do things and i know i mean i struggle with technology so i'm yeah with with my parents, it's phone calls because I know if I have to try and ask them to show them how to click certain buttons, they're going to say very nice words to me. So, but I think in terms of encouragement, it is maybe like try and figure out with your parents what gives them a sense of joy normally. So is it to, you know, to have conversations with each other? Is it about having a good book because all of these things if you can figure out what their pockets of joy is then you can go and if it is about a book and they don't have access to the book you can drive and go drop off the book or if it's about music go old school cut a cd or a tape i don't know do they still have tapes back in my day they had lots of tapes but i don't know if we have tapes anymore but do something just find out what it is that will make them feel a sense of joy and also around again going like you know acknowledging the fact that we don't we don't have control over this so we just need to take it day by day and for them to also just be honest with what it is that they need and what it is that they're struggling with because unfortunately the older generation is a lot more reserved and internalize a lot more. So it would be good for people mm -hmm. to sort of encourage the fact going like, look, mom, dad, we're all going through a tough time. So I'm sure you guys are going through a tough time too. Do you want to chat about it? Let me know what's what's bugging you. And then taking it from there. Well, I absolutely love that. I think you gave us some really good advice there. Again, the coffee comes up and at this stage, I want to just tell you that the results of our poll is 88% that coffee equals joy. <laughs> Your vote can still make a difference. You're welcome to go vote. <laughs> so our very last question of the day um, is from Yasira. And thank you, Yasira, for posting this because it is important. How can you ex uh, assist people who are struggling with anxiety due to living in an abusive household during this time? Okay, so this has been quite a, a serious and quite a um, worrying conversation that's been going on since the moment lockdown started. And this is also where a lot of people were advocating going, you know, we can't expect every household to actually adhere to the lockdown rules and that we need our social systems to be in place in order for if people are feeling stuck within an abusive environment, that there are avenues that you can contact. So even with SADAC, I think on SADAC's um, website, there's also the, the hotlines you can call. And on the Western Cape 
government's website, there's also the, the numbers that you can call for do domestic violence. My advice would be if it is a high risk situation, get out. Um, try and get hold of the social networks to assist you. Um, it is, I think it's unfair to try and uh, to try and expect from people that just because we're in this situation, that now you need to learn how to cope with it. You should not have to be able to cope with it. It's not, it shouldn't be happening in the first place. Sorry, I, I know I'm sounding quite strict here, but that's also my ad advocacy side coming out. Um, so I think if you really feel that a person is at risk, then try your best to get all the social networks to assist you in getting the person to a place of safety. If it, if it is like a more of a relationship where there's a lot of gaslighting happening or emotional abuse, that kind of thing, um, then it is about you, you, you can just be there for that person and make sure that they realize and understand that they're good enough. This is not what they deserve, that you make sure that their self-worth is intact. That it's not, this is happening to me because I'm, I'm a bad person. I'm not a good enough partner. I'm not a good enough parent. I'm not a good enough this, that. That you just make sure that you speak through that. But again, with any kind of abusive situation, whether financially, emotionally, physically, try and get assistance. Whether professional psychologists or whether it is through, through social networks that can assist you in the process. I absolutely, I absolutely love that advice. Thank you so much. Um, I know that if you're stuck in a violent situation or a scary situation, you don't always have the option to leave right away. But if you can't leave right away, start making your plans and start building your network so that one day you can get away because one day you will be strong enough. If you're out there and you're seeing this today, one day you will yeah. be strong yeah. enough. Now, um, Dr. Barnos has been amazing um, in, 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 in being here today. She has also given us an amazing gift. If you are uncomfortable writing a letter telling us how you feel today, we are going to send you out an email with her address on, and you will be able to contact with her directly via email. She will be uh, willing to assist you or to refer you like that. The second thing that I want to say is my best friend Audrey always used to say, if you need to take your meds, take your meds, because your life will be better if you do. If you need meds today, don't think that you don't need it because you're alone or whatever the situation is going to be okay. Take your meds, you need it. And with that, I want to thank Dr. Broncos so much and I want to thank you for being here. You're welcome to join us on Facebook on our Touch Base group. We've I've added it in the side. I've added Jane in my LinkedIn details. So connect with us so that you don't miss our future virtual webinars. And we're going to try and keep it as relevant as possible. Over to you, Jane, for a goodbye message. Yeah, just thank you so much again for joining us, Omega. We really value you giving up your time to really share your experience, your expertise. I think there's a lot of comments, people saying this is so helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Great insights. So thank you for your feedback, everybody who's been here today. And we're so glad um, and it gives us a sense of meaning and purpose to be able to be part of something that is adding value to other people's lives. So we're really excited about that. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. I am off to go and make myself some pocket of joy. <laughs> A coffee. <laughs> awesome. And, awesome. <laughs> uh, but again, thank you so much. And we look so so forward to seeing you again at the next webinar, everybody. Thanks again, Omega. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah. That's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Have a wonderful day, everyone. It's 2 o'clock and we're offline. Goodbye. Till next time. Bye. Bye.